So. Good. That'll give us justification for the next season. Uh, Andre, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about in inflation theory. Uh, you've described it in general terms. Uh, uh, give us some sense of the enormity of uh, of what's happening. Um, well, uh, the total size of the part of the universe which we see right now yeah. can be described by the number 10 with 28 zeros. So it is 10 to the degree 28. Yeah, and okay, right. It's a pretty huge number uh, right. on the human scale. Well, uh, the question is uh, why our universe is so large? And we needed to have some theory which explain this greatness of the universe. Mm -hmm. And there are many other questions like that. Why different parts of the universe started expanding simultaneously? Why the universe is so homogeneous, different parts of it look very much alike? Right. Now, in order to answer this, we need... These are all problems yeah. that you had well, to solve. Well, these were the problems. Uh, and yeah. we got the answer to, to this problem. And when we That's why you're here. Oh, right. <laughs> if you didn't have the but, answer, you wouldn't but, be here. But, you know, the, the problems, they look kind of metaphysical. People could have an excuse not answering them. They could say, well, the universe is given to us in one copy, and you never ask questions about it. Right. It's just given to you. You study it, but you don't ask why. It is just the universe. Well, inflationary theory allows you to give a simple answer to all of these questions simultaneously. And when you got the answer, you cannot forget it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so the answer is that the universe started expanding extremely fast in this vacuum-like state. Mm -hmm. And when you estimate how fast and what will be the size of the universe after the expansion, you get the number not 10 to the degree 28, but 10 to the degree 1 billion or greater than that, depending on the theory. So yeah. what happens, you have a small piece of space, then this space explodes. So your theory that we are, are everything we see, everything that Wendy sees, is in an infinitesimally yes. small part of, yes. of all that there is. Yes. And Whatever that's an observers. Part is we yeah. only have accessible what light, right. and given the age of the universe and the finite travel time for light, all that we have accessible to right. us. Now, is most people think in science that the, nothing can go faster than light. This is part of Einstein's um, original theory. But what you're saying travels enormously faster than light at the early beginning because it's not matter. Well, uh, Einstein's bounds uh, apply to the speed of the signal. Uh -huh. It does not apply to the speed of expansion of the whole thing. So. Uh, the inflation theory tells you how fast is the whole space uh, expanding. There is no uh, bound on, on the speed of expansion of the universe. Leon, as you told me, you were there, so do you believe this stuff? Yeah, well, that's what I was going to ask. One of my high school students, in fact, probably all of them, will say, gee, this is a very interesting thing, but you know, I really wasn't there. I mean, I came a little late. And nobody is ever going to be able to verify that such a thing took place. So the, my question the high school students would say is, could there be another explanation for the world which we know? I prefer to use fields which people like Leon have already seen. That if you just use the standard physics, relativity, quantum mechanics, and what's called the standard model of particle physics, which involves the fields we've actually seen, mm -hmm. then there is a unique solution to how the universe began. And all of this gives you a solution that is a single Yes, universe. that's a unique, a, a unique, a unique solution. Unique solution. They all, if you and what you mean by a unique solution is this one universe that Wendy sees that mm -hmm. none of us see, that she sees, yes. is the, the only thing there is. Yes. Okay. Now, is, all is right, it? that's what I, 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 that's <laughs> what conclusion I want. Nancy, what, what, is, uh, what is your view of inflationary theory versus uh, a unique universe? Well, it's um, uh, a disappointment to me that the inflationary theory has taken off so well, because when George and I wrote our book, we started out with the sort of results that Frank Tipler was talking about uh, in terms of the anthropic principle, and we thought, aha, if there's only one universe, and uh, we know the cosmological constants involved in this one, uh, and people are saying it looks like it's had to have been designed by a brilliant mathematician, it looks like we've got grounds for a new design argument. Uh, design but, meaning design argument is one of the classic arguments for the existence of God. Exactly. Right. And uh, others of those have gone by the wayside. They usually last for about 150 <laughs> years before someone like Darwin comes along and destroys them. But it looks like Andre Linde has come along and destroyed ours in two years flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was not the purpose. <laughs> I know, I know. But remember, he has to invent new physics to do this. Yeah. Would you like to see one or the other of these survive in order to give additional support to the design argument for the existence of God, or do you think you can handle it either way? It's not clear to me at, that, at this point. I'll uh, refrain from answering <laughs> well, that I'd if I like may. I'd like to add, you'd like an experiment to decide. Okay, how, how do you do I that? Think, well, 
I think it's important to make the point that our conception of the universe has changed dramatically over the last 400 years. We originally thought that the sun was the center of the universe, right. the earth was the center of the universe, and the right. sun, I even this century, we thought that the sun was the center of the universe. We now know the sun is one star in our Milky Way galaxy, and our galaxy is one galaxy right. out of billions of right. other galaxies. So, and, and we're really at the forefront now, so we're talking about things that haven't been subjected right. to the same kinds of experimental tests. And ultimately, experiment, we may dis differ here. <laughs> he thinks theory may ultimately decide. <laughs> but I think... You've got to see it. you got to see it. I think most people <laughs> want to see it uh, to yes. be convinced. Yeah, but... but, but and and, and to, in Andre's favor, there's a lot of uh, experiments. You won't reject what he's saying out of hand because it's so... You know, outla not outlandish in a bad sense, but in a very complementary sense. It's an unbelievably creative... Yes. solution to some very complicated problems. But and you, consistent. You can't it's consistency. And consistency. consistent with other data that we have. Yeah. I want, I'm waiting for them, for the standard model to pop out of one of these guys' theories. But we know the part of that. The problem basically are. is that these guys are arrogant. <laughs> We're all arrogant. <laughs> and I, 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 when I was a director of a big laboratory, I preached against arrogance, and they took me seriously. I heard this one guy say, Dear Lord, forgive me the sin of arrogance. And Lord, by arrogance, I mean the following. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, the anthropic principle comes in two flavors, if you will, uh, a weak one and a strong one. What's the difference? The weak anthropic principle, Robert, says that the universe must be consistent with the evolution of intelligent life. Mm -hmm. And a surprisingly a, a strong selection principle. The strong anthropic principle says the universe must give rise to intelligent life at some point in its history. That sounds like it's causative almost. Yes. Leon, does that sound like philosophy to you? Uh, well, that's the point. I just want to make clear that this is not physics. It's not even science, in my opinion. It's philosophy. Now, a lot of people respect philosophy. But not physicists. It has a role. Not physicists, <laughs> generally, right? And, uh, but, but it doesn't matter whether you respect it or not. I think one has to make a clear distinction. This is not something which is subject to the traditional tests of of, of, uh, of a, theory, a theory or a model. Well, uh, I like atropic principle very much, uh, unlike many cosmologists. Uh, but there is a good reason why many cosmologists do not like it, because there are uh, so many crackpots who just use this <laughs> principle very Theologians, easily. Theologians, for instance. <laughs> um, very, 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 very easily without uh, uh, real understanding and without real motivation, just to give an easy answer. Well, so if you use it carefully, then it is a powerful weapon. But if you use it indiscriminately, then it hurts all of us. Nancy, how do you use the anthropic principle uh, in, a, uh, uh, in terms of understanding theology? Well, it certainly did look like uh, good evidence that the universe had to be designed. And if Frank says the universe had to be the way it is in order uh, to permit, um, uh, it had to be the way it is such that it would permit life one asks what's the basis of that had to be and so you're getting into the questions of why is there a universe and what is uh, I think there's a universe because somewhere way back uh, there were the laws of physics the laws of physics said there had to be a universe the laws of physics were there now she's going to ask me who put the laws of physics there and exactly I'll, say, <laughs> I'll think about it for a while All right. well it's what we call an infinite yeah. regress that it's you go back, back and back yeah. and back and I, I, I'm afraid that uh, you may ask this question in a different way. If you say that first there were laws of physics, but no universe, then where these laws of physics have been written? If there was first a universe without laws of physics, then how the universe could exist without mm -hmm. laws of physics? And it looks like we uh, have a universe together with the laws of physics. Yeah. And also, and if you have the laws of physics, it, it, you immediately have to have a universe, um, don't you? Well, they, they just uh, pop up simultaneously. Yeah. But who tells you that they pop up? Well, we are telling because we are observing. So it looks like we have uh, three objects binded together. Laws of physics, our universe, and us. Yeah. And therefore, yes, indeed, they are related. Wendy, I think there's a danger in all of this uh, theory not focused back on what the hard data is. I think that's right. I think to some extent it may be that ultimately the way Leon was saying before, we'll be able to have a complete theory that will explain numbers of quarks and all other experimental data. But it may also be that if there are many universes, you can't directly test that. And you may have to rely on something like the anthropic principle, which is unsatisfying to a lot of people. But it comes back. It all, we're now at the forefront, that's what we're talking about, questions that are unanswered. Mm. And Andre raised before, there are many questions